Hi, I'm Ian Taylor. I'm the CTO of uh, SembaChain. I'm just going to give you a walkthrough of uh, the SembaChain platform, uh, which can be found at uh, app.sembachain.com. Uh, um, so we have this kind of blockchain uh, <laughs> network here that you can play around with while you're uh, thinking about logging in. Um, so logging into the platform, if you want access to the platform, just uh, shoot us an email over at SembaChain and we can add your email address and generate you an account. Um, so I'm going to log in with my uh, Notre Dame uh, email here. Uh, okay, so let's uh, go on the platform. This uh, account I've used to create one organization uh, and an application and a group uh, previously. In the management tab, you can create an organization and we created Semba here to pour our apps for this demo into. I wanted to focus this part of the demo on the smart contract piece. So let's just go through to editing a smart contract. So I previously created a, um, a smart contract for this account called Car Demo. Um, and this is a very simple piece of Solidity code. Basically, it just has three methods. So it has a, a method to register a car, uh, supplying things like a, a VIN number, a make, a model. Um, and it also allows, you see this bundle hash here. This is a special variable we use that allows us to off-chain data. So just by including this, this string, it tells the system that you're going to be able to add any number of files to this uh, to any of these methods. So you can, within Semba, uh, we use the term bundles because you can attach multiple files using multi-platform multi uh, posts. Um, and those files are basically wrapped up, <coughs> um, stored into the backend file system, and we generate a manifest called a bundle. Um, and that basically stores all the information about all of those files and the identifiers for those files. And then we take a hash of that particular manifest and we store that in this variable here. So the fingerprint gets stored on the blockchain, everything else is off-chain. So here, this um, smart contract, we can register a car, we can do an accident report, and we can do a car sale. Um, so if we compile that smart contract, that'll tell us if there's any errors. So that goes through just the Ethereum uh, compiler on the back end, and it will come back and say, you know, what the result of that was. So just give it a second. Okay, so here the output from the compiler. So loads of small warnings, um, but no errors. So, so that's fine. So if we click on this graph uh, view here, what happens is that we can generate different views of that. So now we've got this uh, Solidity smart contract. You can start with a smart contract. You could also start with this assets and transactions view. So let's take a look at that. So the asset is a, is a car and the transaction on the car, a car sale, registered car, and accident report. Now this screen here can be used to auto generate the solidity. So let's have a look at that another way. Let's look at the graph view of this. Well, this does a basically a simple graph showing the relationship between the assets and each of the transactions for that particular asset. So we have a car sale, a register car, and an accident report, which are all transactions on a car asset. Well, we can add another asset. So we could say uh, add a transaction to a transport car. And the asset name is a car. And what parameter transport car uh, company used to transport the parameter? So let's add a, st a string there. Add another parameter to say date transferred. And the parameter name there is um, an int as a Unix timestamp. Um, done. And then that adds that extra transaction. So now we have four transactions here. And the smart contract is automatically being rewritten to include this transport car method. So we didn't have to write any Solidity code there. We just added the transaction on the asset and it, it wrote the code for us. And if we go to the graph here, we can see that the car now has a transport car method added to this particular um, smart contract. Beneath all of these screens is a model. So if you click this, this tab here, it shows you the model. And it's basically, for, for those technical out there, this is a UML model that allows us to kind of translate between these graphical models um, solidity and the asset and transaction core view that we, we can kind of store. So this is important because let's let's save this new modified. Um, so this is a car demo extended smart contract. And we're going to save that in the Simba organization. So click save there. So that smart contract is saved. 
Now, you notice these different uh, assets and transactions. This is important to understand. So when we um, create an application from these, what's going to happen is we're going to have these assets and transactions on that application. So they're going to form part of the API for that application. So let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to add a new application. And I'm going to call this car demo extended. And I'm going to put it into the Simba organization. Click create. Um, this is just been created, so let's go ahead and configure it. Well, so to configure it, there's four different steps. You choose your blockchain, uh, the blockchain type and, and the network you want to run on it. The file system, you choose your smart contract, and then you, you choose the name you want to call the API. So let's go through, let's choose Ethereum here. Um, the network type, let's choose RinkP. I've got a wallet for a RinkP, so I'm going to choose that. The file system, so this is where all your off-chain data goes. Everything that you attach to any transaction gets uh, bundled and, and stored here. So we've got IPFS. Um, so here, let's make this uh, permission-based true. So that means that the data aspect of this is permissioned. You can define your users, you can define their roles, and how they access the particular methods in your smart contract, which is basically going to be a, an interface to the blockchain. And then if you go through smart contract, well, we've got a couple of smart contracts here. So this car demo extended smart contract is the one I just generated. And if I go through and I call the car demo extended, I'm going to configure that. And what happens is um, that will go off and create a transaction on the, the Ring B network. It will deploy that smart contract. But to do that, I need to give it a wallet. So I'm going to unlock the wallet that I've previously stored in my browser, which is, um, uh, this is my public address for that. It takes the wallet, it signs that transaction, and then sends it off to RinkB for deployment. So I've just deployed that onto RinkB, um, and you can see that's deploying now. Once that's deployed, um, we'll have a running application. So this new application we've, we've generated, the, the car demo extended, Let's go and have a look to see what that looks like. You can see that we, we um, gave it this uh, API name, uh, car demo extended. So let's click on that and see what it did. This is a Swagger interface. Do you notice that, you know, that modification of that smart contract um, automatically generated, generated that new model in the back end, which automatically generated this API for your application. So you can see that these, these other um, methods like for registering a car, for selling a car, they're all included, but these new transport car methods are also um, uh, included. So you can see that this is the access information remote user and API key, which um, allows the API to identify the user and the permissions. Um, but then we have um, a car, uh, we have a company, and we had a date transferred, which is the new method that we added to the smart contract. And this is all visible through a post and a get method for this particular smart contract. Uh, so do you have a, a REST API to your smart contract, which interfaces directly with RinkB, which was all set up through this simple process um, through Simba chain. And uh, you also have methods for searching um, so each of the operations here, so this transaction method within the context of this particular smart contract that is deployed on RankB, you can list and search all transactions. So you can basically list all the transactions, get every single thing that's happened within the context of the smart contract and methods, or you could um, search any particular variable. So for any method or ID names, you can search based on the exact name of the car, um, whether the car contains a particular string. So, so the date transferred is, is an integer, so you can basically do a date range, find all cars that were transferred between you know, March and April 2019. You can do things like that. So every parameter based on its type, we generate um, a set of search metrics that can be used. So if it's an integer, it's a range. If it's a string, it's a, an exact match or, or basically a substring match and so forth. So it's a very flexible system that allows you to search all these transactions. Okay, on this portion of the demo, we're gonna take a look at permissions. So let's take a look at this car demo extended uh, smart contract and application API we just created. You'll notice um, there's two things here. There's permission file system or permission blockchain. 
Now this is RankB, which is a public network, so it's not possible to permission a public network. So automatically this is just not available on our public networks. If we chose a, a private network, Circle of Life is, is one that we provide here at SimbaChain, then you would be able to permission the blockchain network at all. That would mean that the, the information going onto the blockchain itself would be restricted to certain groups and people that belong to those certain groups. Um, but here, what, what, what we're allowed to do on a public network is we're allowed to permission the data. So any information, any files that you attach alongside those transactions, the ones that are getting bundled up and, and stored into the file system, we can permission those and we can set permissions on that. So let's see how we, we do that. So this is, if this is true, then we can go to the management page and we can look at the organizations that we have because we can have multiple organizations and we can look at the applications within those organizations and uh, we have car demo extended and we can see that um, in car demo extended um, it's not permission blockchain but there is a permission file system so in order to uh, apply those permissions to you know this api what we first do is to create a group so a group maybe we have a group that is car sales so let's add a group called car sales and then let's add another group called um, car info. So we have two groups in this application. Now each of these groups can set permissions on each of the smart contract methods. So for car info, say this is a group that allows a person, you know, a manufacturer of a car, for example, to post information about the car just made. So in this case, they're not probably interested in, you know, transporting cars or car sales or accidents because that it's out of their hands. It's, it's along to the, the dealers or whatever at that point, but they do want to be able to register the car. So if we set permission for the register car method for set info to be able to read the info and write it, you can also set a time range. So you can say, so the car info group can have access to writing and reading data onto this file system between, you know, for the month of October. But after that, it's not allowed to write anymore. You can apply rules like that. But I'm just going to say it's allowed to basically post information onto, onto this system. And then I click this uh, rule applied button down here, which enables what I've set up there. So this just basically enables you to toggle things on and off. Uh, you might want to set up certain permissions and then just turn them off temporarily while you're developing and then turn them on to test the, the permissions um, set correctly. So, so in this circumstance, I'm going to set for, for car info, I'm going to allow car info group. Any user that's in that car info group can register a car, um, but they can't do anything else. I'm not going to add other permissions. So by default, these are all uh, false. So I'm going to leave them false. So they can register a car, but they can't sell a car. They can't transport a car and they can't uh, register accidents. However, the car sales group, they'd be allowed to uh, sell a car. So they would be able to enter information to um, do a car sale. They can also transport a car to a customer. So they would be able to access this smart contract method in order to transport a car. And they also could file an accident report. If, for example, the car got damaged in the lot or whatever, they might need to file a report onto the blockchain uh, pertaining to uh, what what happened to that uh, the car in that particular incident so that's kind of a simple kind of overview of, of how we set permissions these permissions then are baked into the the api and those rules are applied all the way through to protect the the, the methods of the smart contract and the way it works on the front end so your application you have users and you, you can there's an api to attach users to particular groups and then once that user is in that particular group the rules that you set here uh, restrict uh, what they can do on the platform. So you can basically set up many, many groups of users doing having different functions within the network and have a completely permissioned system with respect to the file system. So the data that you store, the files that you attach to the transactions or the transactions themselves on a private blockchain. Another aspect of Simba is that it allows uh, wallet implementations to be plugged into the, the applications easily. Every transaction that happens, whether it's a deployment of a smart contract or a transaction on a smart contract, they all need to be signed using a wallet because they're accessing systems like RinkB and, and the public Ethereum network, which um, where there's a cost for those transactions, whether on RinkB it's not really a cost, it's uh, fictitious um, Ether, but still there's a wallet implementation 
um, to get you into the mode for, for using that, that, those wallets um, on the public network. So we provide support for that. Um, uh, within Simba, whenever there's a call to an API to post a transaction, there's a call back. Uh, you, we basically take that transaction, we, we generate the stub for the transaction that needs to be sent to the blockchain, and then we post that back to the user uh, onto the client side of the application, in this case, the browser. And then the browser would need to sign that transaction with the private key of the wallet in order to post it back to the blockchain. For this, we provide in the dashboard a, a wallet implementation. Um, here I've, I've registered uh, an account previously. Um, this is a wallet that I've registered on Rinkby. And to access that, um, I just put in the password uh, for that <coughs> wallet and it will basically give me the uh, access to the wallet. It will tell me how what network it's um, applicable to and how many Ether I have left on that. And these are the transactions. So these are all of the transactions that I've, I've had deploying various smart contracts and, and performing smart, um, you know, transactions on those smart contracts. This is kind of a critical so a point of the, the system because these wallets, uh, this wallet implementation is only on my browser, which is on my laptop, on my machine. So the, the wallet information, the private key of any wallet that you, you own with Simba stays on your own local machine. And the workflow about how that interacts with the Simba API is that when we uh, generate a transaction, the transaction comes back to you for signing to the client so that all of the signing is done locally on your machine or on your client application that you control the keys for your customers for and the signed transaction is being passed through to Simba to the API for writing onto the blockchain. Each application on Simba chain can be configured to receive notifications. So let's set up a notification for the car demo extended. Um, to do that, you go through to the notification tab and register a notification. You choose the application you want to register a notification for, click continue, and you have a choice of uh, setting up a webhook notification or an email notification. I'm going to set up an email notification here, click continue, um, and I'm going to ian at whatever.com and subscribe to that. Okay, so if I look at the managed notifications, I have an email notification uh, set up at ian at whatever.com. And if we go back and set up another one, we can register another um, notification for Cardem Extended. And we can set up a web hook, for example, to go through to http uh, cardemo.simbachain.com alert, for example. And we can add some specific header content there, like auth headers or whatever, um, to connect to that particular URL and path and hit subscribe there. And then again, we have those two. So whenever anything happens, whenever there's a smart contract deployed or a transaction occurring on this um, car demo extended, we're gonna get a, an email to in at whatever.com and a webhook notification to the Simba chain car demo site at the path alert 